When the science in the 18th century gallery in the Science Museum in London, well, we take for granted that science belongs to the public, but it hasn't always been the case. At the end of the 17th century, science was discussed by a very small elite around the Royal Society. That all began to change in the first decade of the 18th century. This was due in part to the existence of the coffee houses, which provided a venue, to newspapers where lectures could be advertised, most importantly to an increase in the middle classes who had leisure and an interest in new things that were happening around them and wanted to go and see lectures with demonstrations and experiments which had relevance to their lives. So this is really how science became known to a new and wider audience and of course today science is discussed, known, read about, visited by just about everybody. In this gallery we have our George III collection which is a combination of instruments made for King George III when he came to the throne in 1760 and 1761 some of them were made and another collection which belonged to Stephen de Mainbray, a lecturer who toured the country in the mid 18th century demonstrating his rather tattier set of instruments. Now while the instruments made for the king are really beautiful, the George Adams instruments in particular. The instruments belonging to Stephen de Mainbray are actually even more interesting and unique because they tell us what a large number of people were learning about 250 years ago. When George III came to the throne in 1760, he had two sets of apparatus made for him by the leading London instrument maker, George Adams. And one of the sets was on mechanics. And the course of mechanics that the king was supposed to follow started with what they called attraction of bodies. One of the first pieces of apparatus that the king was supposed to study in the mechanics course is this little piece called the oil of oranges. You were supposed to put a drop of oil between the glass plates and balance the forces of gravity and what we would now call capillarity or the attraction of bodies. If you separate the glass plates very slightly at the lower end, then the attraction upwards of capillarity balances the attraction of gravity downwards and you get the drop of oil to be stationary at the midpoint between the two glass plates. This beautiful piece of apparatus is called the Archimedean screw and it was used to show how water could be raised and in fact this method of raising water was quite popular in the 18th century. The water is represented by a little ball which is in the hollow tube and as you turn the handle the ball will move up the tube and then drop into the funnel and go back to the bottom again ready to be lifted up again so you can just carry on turning the handle and lifting up the balls. This magnet is actually made of magnetite but covered in silver because obviously it's the royal magnet and it followed the oil of oranges in explaining the attraction of bodies and what they did with this magnet was actually weigh its strength against a weight on a large balance. So rather like the oil of oran oranges you have two balancing forces, the gravity on one side and the magnetic force on the other. This is the inclined plane made by George Adams for King George III and as you can see it imitates a cobbled road. You can have it at different inclinations and you can test all these different wheels on this lovely hay cart. Wheels were a big issue in the mid-18th century because of the state of the roads and the narrower the wheel obviously the more damage it was going to do to the roads but the wide wheels are more expensive. Similarly wheels with large radius are more efficient but they cost more than the wheels with the small radius. So all these experiments that were being done on this inclined plane had a relevance for real life. This lovely object is the philosophical table, so called, which was really the centrepiece of the mechanics apparatus made for George III. And you can see on one end is a pillar, and on that pillar is what we call an isochronous pendulum, a pendulum which is supposed to swing at the same time even at very large amplitudes. And it has, to make it do this, what we call cycloidal cheeks. The cycloid was a curve only discovered relatively recently at the time, 
and it was found that if the pendulum swung be between these cheeks, it would always swing with exactly the same period. In the middle of the table is the central forces machine, which is probably the most complex piece of apparatus that George Adams made for George III. This particular central forces machine has steel rods on which you can put weights, and then you can obviously vary the velocity, you can vary the weights, and you hear when they get to the ends of the rods because the bells will ring. This is the magnificent air pump that George Adams made for George III in 1761. It's the centerpiece of the pneumatics apparatus. Um, not only could it evacuate, which was quite normal, but it could also compress air. Um, this chamber that you see on top here is the compression chamber. As you may know, um, it was quite common to nearly kill animals in air pumps. Often they were nearly killed and then brought back to life again. Occasionally, of course, they were killed. But there was also schools of thought which believed this was cruel and other, other items were substituted for the animals. What happens is that a guinea and a feather were held at the top of the tube and the, tube, the air in the tube was evacuated using the air pump. Then the guinea and feather were dropped and instead of the normal situation where obviously the guineas drop straight away and the feather sort of flutters down, they dropped exactly together. So paradoxes, it's not really a paradox, but surprising things like this were very popular in the 18th century, like the rolling double cone or the whirling tubes. This is the lovely electrostatic machine that George Adams made for George III in 1765. It's a plate machine, which means that by turning the electric plate and rubbing it against these pads, you create um, the electric charge, which is then taken off by these combs and stored in what's called the primary conductor, which is this brass cylinder. Also here, we've got a little electrometer, which in a way measures the amount of charge in the primary conductor, because a spark will jump between the primary conductor and that little brass knob that's fairly close to it. And there's a sort of measure, rather crude measure here, of the distance of the electrometer to the primary conductor. So it gives you an idea of how much charge is there. Obviously, this sort of thing is quite spectacular. And all the electrostatics experiments that we have in the collection are very beautiful and very spectacular. This is a very early Leiden jar, one of the first ones. They could store electricity, and so they enabled all sorts of different experiments to be done. In fact, really, the invention of the Leiden jar opened up electrostatics as a new subject to add to, say, mechanics, pneumatics, optics, the things that were already being done. This is a beautiful piece of apparatus, which is electrostatic chimes. What you did, you put the charge down the central column here, and the electric wind from the points turned um, this central part, and the little um, clapper goes around and hits the bells in turn and you can get a beautiful sound from the bells. This experiment here is similar in a way, but, but visual. Um, again, you electrify the central column, and the individual spangle tubes, as they're called, are electrified, and when they are, the charge runs down the spangles, lighting them up. So you get these lovely spirals of colored light. This piece of apparatus here um, illustrates how a lightning conductor works. And there was a lot of debate about lightning conductors and how they best work in the 18th century. Again, you electrify the top point there. A spark jumps between those brass balls. And if the little square is not put in place properly there, it will jump out, which illustrates the damage done to a building. This lovely piece of apparatus here is the electrical orrery. You can see the sun, moon, and earth system. Again, when you electrify it, you can turn it because the wind, the electric wind, will come off the points. And so you have this beautiful piece of apparatus which is turning around because of the electric charge. George III occasionally showed people his apparatus, and we certainly know from the lecturers that when they were giving their courses, they would finish with optics so that they could praise Newton to the skies and show his lovely experiments on light and colour.